Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell and welcome to EWTN Live where we bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to our guest tonight, I want to mention that today is the feast of Saint Januarius, an Italian San Gennaro. He's named, um, interestingly enough, after one of the famous Roman gods, Janus, who had two faces, and uh, but he's transformed the name. He died during the, the period of martyrdom under the emperor Diocletian. Diocletian was the, uh, led the last of the Roman persecutions of the church, but it was the worst. And just a very large number of martyrs died. Many, many copies of the Bible and prayer books were destroyed. And we uh, have great saints like Januarius who stood for the faith over against lots of torture and torment and held his position. And we still honor him as St. Januarius. By the way, it'll, it's on this day that they shake his blood to see if it turns liquid or not. And this is always a key thing. All right, we have a guest tonight who is also from the same part of the world, from Italy. Uh, not the same side of Italy, but in the South. He's internationally known, uh, Italian opera singer. He has shared his vocal talents all over the world. And in addition, he gives lots of support for international charitable causes, his devotion to his Catholic faith, and more specifically, his devotion to St. Padre Pio has led him to create a nonprofit charity organization dedicated to the promotion of the spiritual charisma of St. Pio of Pietrocina. And we are very blessed to have several of the relics of St. Padre Pio's life here with us, right here on the set, on the tables here, as well as over here on the set. So please welcome the president and CEO of the St. Pio Foundation, Mr. Luciano La Monarca. Welcome. Benvenuto. Thank you. You see, I always tell people that we get guests from all around the world, and you are from Italy. I am from Italy, but if I may say, you got Padre Pio here in the studio, so and he's from what the, can yeah, be yeah. better than that? Not much, not <laughs> much. That's actually, thank you very much, first of all, for not only being with us tonight, but bringing these relics of St. Pio. Uh, this is uh, truly an honor. Um, it is no, also us to thank, to thank EWTN for this great opportunity for bringing this spiritual sign of Padre Pio to many more uh, devotee and faithful that are not able to venerate the relics personally. Yeah, you know, growing up, you know, uh, I was a, my late teens, I was, uh, I think, just about, you know, I was in college or so when he died. And uh, throughout my life, people spoke often of uh, Padre Pio and the, the powerful confessor that he was. Also, one who didn't take any nonsense from people who were lukewarm in their penitence. And he could read souls and such. And I was blessed to um, go to his town, um, uh, San Giovanni, San Giovanni Rotondo. Rotondo. I've been there a couple times. That's just been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, sometimes I think I was glad that I got there after he passed away so it wouldn't be poking around in my soul too much. <laughs> Makes me nervous. Um, but what is it that led you to this devotion to St. Pio? What brought you to, to this? Well, how you explained before, Father Mitch, I am an Italian opera singer. I was born and lived in the Puglia region, a blessed region because it's where Padre Pio lived and died eventually. Right, so Puglia is in what part of Italy? So Puglia, folks who don't sure. know the So Puglia is well. southeast. Mm -hmm. It's often called the Hill of the Boot. So right. we are on the Adriatic coast. It's a four hours driving from Rome. Right. So you have Naples or 
Benevento from, from where Bishop San Gennaro was from. Mm -hmm. We are just on the east coast, on the right. hill. So the Adriatic Sea is over there, and it's a very important area throughout history. It's very so, important uh, area. It's a beautiful area, beautiful and area. as as we were mentioned before, we are blessed because not only we had the, the town of San Giovanni Rotondo and the monastery and the church where Padre Pio actually located in 1918 and then actually lived and died, but also we have the cave of the Archangel Michael and the Basilica of San Nicolas, where part of his remains are. And also, not too far away is Lanciano, Lanciano with the famous uh, uh, miracle of the Eucharist that's up there. So it's a very, that's why I wanted to go. It's a very blessed place to go visit with a number of places to see along the way. That's correct. So back when I came in this country in 2008 uh, for a few concerts of my own, I was impressed when I was approached by many devotees and faithful that have mostly Italian American that were they wanted to spread the devotion of Padre Pio and was asking me as a tenor to help them to raise their own funds or to raise their own uh, whatever they were putting together to uh, promote their own cause in the name of Padre Pio. Mm -hmm. Along the way in 2010, of course, I immediately met m my wife in 2008. We got married in 2010 in Bari, God, from where I'm from. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, then I believe as many other families, we face our own challenges. It means that we face several miscarriages. Now, as we, we grow up uh, in our Catholic faith, we know that children are given by God. I mean, this is the fruit of a, of a relationship. So we were believing that things were going to happen to us. The first one, though, was not, uh, it was probably the one that touches our soul m more than the others. My wife was uh, on the fifth month of pregnancy when she lost Alma. Mm -hmm. Her was the name. We lost yeah. her on 3rd of December of 2000. So uh, we went through, we went back to San Giovanni Rotondo. I was going for answer, you know, we always ask for the intercession of a saint. We always have to remember that a saint can give us, um, can intercede from us through God. It's God mm -hmm. actually that gives us the miracle or performs right. us the miracle. That's right. If it's the case. S I start to get in touch in, with Monsignor Pierino Galeone, which is a spiritual son of Padre Pio. Today he's 93 years old. He's one of his closest friends. And when I met him, it was 15 of May 2011, it was our anniversary, the first anniversary. Uh, he just immediately, like Padre Pio, he saw me coming and says, Luciano, what you have in your heart? I don't recognize you anymore. So I shared with him exactly what uh, we were facing. And um, he wrote a book. Of course, imp so important Monsignor Galeone was in the life of Padre Pio that he was one of the witness of the, of the canonization on the diocesan canonization process, mm -hmm. and he celebrated mass with John Paul, S Pope John Paul II when Padre Pio was canonized. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did tell me that we were actually eventually having a baby, not soon, and that Padre Pio would have required my full attention in the United States of America. Now, at that time, I didn't really mean what, what Monsignor Galeone meant for me because I was very much focused in my own career. Sure. But then, other loss came. In 2013, I started to pray Padre Pio more intensively, but an intensity at the point that sometimes I could almost feel his presence. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, in on the, uh, April 4, 2014, four years ago, I founded the San Pio Foundation. Mm -hmm. The goal was simple. The beginning as an artist, I want to do things by using the arts, yes. by using music to bring out the message of Padre Pio out there. But then, all of a sudden, friends and supporters, and uh, mostly the hands of Padre Pio, I believe, guided me where I should have gone. In 2015, at the end of 2014, my wife, after five years, discovered she was pregnant. We kept it as a secret, even from my own parents, because we were afraid that it was, it was not going to succeed. But indeed, a boy came. And as Monsignor Galeone was saying, it will be a boy. So we name him Nicolas Sebastian, be Nicolas because of course he's from, coming from the area of Bari, it was my first uh, choice as a name. Sure. So, and to, in a certain way to, for my sign of reverence, for my sign of gratitude of Padre Pio, I intensify to a deep, to, to, to the greatest extent what I've done with the St. Pio Foundation. How? 
In 2017, in 2016, when uh, Pope Francis requested the uh, Padre Pius' body to be exhibited at the, at the Vatican, as you may remember, for the mm -hmm. Holy University, right. right. we saw that as a sign. We saw that many devotees were actually going to Rome, and they were not even familiar with San Giovanni Rotondo. Right. It's not an enormous city. No, it's, it's a, a it's city of 25,000 feet. Yeah, it's a pretty small inhabitant. city. It's a small yeah. city. And also, it's in a very hidden part of the mountain. It's not known unless you don't know Padre Pio. San Giovanni Rotondo itself, as a city, is known because of Padre Pio. Right. Then we saw Cardinal O'Malley from Boston requesting his hearts in Boston. And many others were actually saying that, why, why we cannot have this sign? 90% of those visiting the relics of Padre Pio were never being able to go to his town. And I say, how lucky I am. Every time I get to go to, to meet, my father or my brother or, or my relative, I always stop to San Giovanni Rotondo and then I go back. So I want to give this great opportunity. And that's what happened that on the 130 anniversaries of Padre Pio's birth last year, we decided to sponsor this first ever tour of the relics of Padre mm -hmm. Pio because we specifically wanted to bring the spiritual sign of the saint to many thousand of devotees or curious or faithful that are in this country. So to allow them to request Padre Pio intercession. This, this is a, a wonderful thing because on one hand, um, everybody knows that we're dealing with a crisis that is about the priesthood. And here we have this 20th century priest who is an important antidote by his own holiness of life, and not just a holiness by which you say, oh, yeah, he's a good guy. No, it's an exemplary holiness that goes beyond the norm, and the Lord's great gifts to him, especially in the confessional. And he, you know, time will tell over the years, but he will be a rival to um, uh, Saint Jean de Vianney as a patron for confessors. Uh, he's, he's just that, that important and that good. And we very much need that kind of good example, of great sanctity among the priests. And he's a great one. Plus, his prayers seem still very powerful. I agree 100% with you, Father Mitch. And indeed, I believe what we have to see in Padre Pio is our model an inspiration for us. Many people remember Padre Pio because he was a saint that received the stigmata. I, th I ask people to go just further than that. Padre Pio was a holy man which was, who was called already a saint while he was in life. But besides that, when I had the chance to meet several of his friends that are still alive today, we actually have one in Bronx, he does remember me all the time. What conquers Padre Pio? His humility his reverence, mm -hmm. his serving God to the purpose of starting in the morning. He was waking up in the morning as early as 3 o'clock and having hundreds of people waiting for him to say Mass at 5 o'clock and was always the last to go to bed. Always his goal was to save souls and spending up to 12 or 14 hours in confessional, as you said, mm -hmm. and having the virtues on look on those who were going to confess with him if they were going to true but they were missing some things. We were always hoping that they, they were saying the truth because being improved by Padre Pio was not an easy task, I was told. Yes, yeah, it was, uh, uh, he would be someone who, who had this gift that like Saint Jean Vianney mm -hmm. of being able to uh, have insight in, uh, into souls that oftentimes call it uh, being able to read souls, what's, what's going on. He never knew these people, never met them in his life. That's correct. Strangers from around the world. And he would tell them, you can't come to confession yet. You're not sorry. Uh, some, I mean, every so often I even will mention to some people, are you confessing or are you bragging? <laughs> you know, this is an important <laughs> distinction you got to make here. <laughs> and uh, he knew the difference. He didn't have to ask him. He could tell no, them. This was uh, great. Uh, it's what... St. Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 12 as a word of knowledge, that he had this spiritually given knowledge uh, along with the word of wisdom. Um, but knowledge is when he knows something 
spiritually about people. And he had that more than, by far, more than most. So this is a, a great gift for us, you know, at this time. But also, there are a lot of people who seek his intercession for important events, or important needs, like you with, you know, you're, after having miscarriages, you, you and your wife, you know, are asking his intercession uh, to have a, a baby that survives and does well. I cannot say, uh, let me put it this way, I cannot say honestly that Padre Pio perhaps has been uh, one of the most important saints that has been uh, receiving so many requests for intercession, but in my, in my life as a founder and president of the St. Pio Foundation, I have heard all kind of requests has been requests to, to the saint, and I have witnessed a couple personally. One is a, a baby who uh, I visited in Los Angeles with Padre Pio Relics, and today is doing much better than the doctor as, as uh, diagnostic to, to him. Mm -hmm. And the other one was just a, a simple yet spiritual miracle. We were in Chicago. I like to say the story because sometimes we always look for the big miracle, but the, the big miracle sometimes stays in the small, simple, yet things that we do every day. There was this woman in Chicago that passed by the church we were with the relics. There were hundreds of faithful outside waiting in hours to venerate the relics. And she didn't know. She asked, who is there? An actor? Because I don't, she was not understanding. Yeah. She says, you didn't know. The relics of Padre Pio are here. So out of curiosity, she stopped. And she went inside the church. She waited hours with her baby. She was fulfilled by the, the spirituality we had in that moment. Mm -hmm. She venerated the relics, and back she went to her mother. She left the church 25 years before. She never put a foot inside the church. Mm -hmm. She called her mother, apologizing for what she has done. And because of Padre Pio, the small miracle happened. And yet, I don't, I, I, I agree with you, it, it looks small because it's not something that a medical doctor or a scientist can analyze and say, oh, this uh, it was something that we can't prove. But that miracle of conversion has a longer last, and that, that can affect a soul for eternity. A healing that happens in this life, you're still going to die. Whether you get healed by a doctor or whether you get healed by a miracle, you're still going to die. Lazarus, I've been to both of his tombs. He has one tomb in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem. I went there, it's empty. I went to his other tomb where he was martyred in Larnaca in Cyprus, and he got to keep that one. And so, <laughs> so this is something that, you know, uh, even though he was raised from the dead, he still died. But conversion of soul lasts for all eternity. When there will be no countries, Italy won't exist, the United States won't exist, the earth won't exist, mm -hmm. that soul is with God. And that's key. That's very important. And you reminded me that, uh, of course, among the many things Padre Pio has been recognized, one is his famous motto. And that motto that we need to simplify in each of his words. Sometimes when I speak with my colleagues, they say, ah, you are your motto, because I like always all the time to go out with Padre Pio motto, which is, as we know, pray, hope, and don't worry. And my colleague says, ah, just be happy. Well, it just, it's not just be happy. See, that, that's a song from Jamaica. <laughs> so don't worry, be, be happy. That's a nice song, <laughs> nice song. I don't know, but that's, that's not question. Padre Pio. What I mentioned, what, what I refer to them many times is, you know, there is three stages. We always know that we are able to pray, we put hope at the third, don't worry, that gets so hard to get. Because it's not about getting some things because we are requesting a miracle, we are requesting intercession of a saint, or we are requesting Padre Pio grace. It's always in God's will. And we can only request Padre Pio's intercession of a saint intercession to do that. But the question is that we always have to live our life each day in God's will. Of course, Having a prayer, hope, and don't worry helps in many ways. And that's why on the fifth anniversary of Padre Pius, I brought this shirt for you for the Oh, Mitch. look at that. 
So, oh, so now you're going to have me advertising the Franciscans. We follow, well, <laughs> actually, we follow Pope Francis' idea when he actually liked the, the, the Super Pope shirt, and we create our own shirt for Padre Pio, a little bit more younger so that we can appeal to the young generation. Yeah. Pray, hope, and don't worry. I simply explain why all these signs. So we have the pray, the rosary, hope, the sign of anchor here, and don't worry, in a certain way, if Padre Pio could laugh with all his suffering, we can too. Of course, a dove with the symbol of peace. I'm proud of Puglia. Puglia is recognized as the most important region from olive oil, so I couldn't miss this because that's from where Padre Pio is from. Minute. Oh, so he even <laughs> got the, uh, the, the advertising going on for the Well, it's Puglia, industry. it's Puglia in my heart. So I brought it for you in the hope that you will unite with me in being testimonial that's of nice. Padre Pio. <laughs> grazie mille, grazie mille. And that will be available from September 21, and we created this special on the 50th anniversary of Padre Pio's passing. See, now what we have to do is have a Puglia region olive oil tasting contest. I'm all for I it. I'm very I good. bet you they have one, right? Sure they of have, they and I, uh, I can recognize many of them. Uh, well, thank you so much. That's great. Um, now, this is something that um, we very much want people to understand too. You've mentioned a lot about the intercession of Padre Pio. And a lot of folks, especially from other church communities, don't understand where that is in the Bible. But when you take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8, where the 24 elders are surrounding God's throne, and they have these golden bowls full of incense. Now, for you opera singers, they also have golden harps, but they also have these golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then you see in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, that the angel also has a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then he takes that incense, puts it on an altar to, on fire and releases the smoke. Mm -hmm. Because incense, I mean, you've been around, I don't know, did, were you an altar server? Yes, I was. And you remember, incense smells good, but when you set it on fire, the aroma is yes. released through the whole room. You have to be really close to incense when it's in nuggets, but when you put it on fire, it's released. And I love that image from Revelation, the saints Take our prayers like nuggets of incense that are sweet smelling and pleasing to God, but they set them on fire because they're so close to God and the aroma fills heaven. That's their job. And that's where St. Pio was someone who knew how to use incense, well, uh, being a priest. I never heard a quote so, so beautiful and perfect. Yeah. to represent what the intercession of the saints is. Well, that's right there in our book of Revelation. And I think for us to see, that's why Hebrews 12 says we approach God, the Father, and we approach the spirits of the righteous ones who have been made perfect. We approach them with our prayers. And it doesn't take away from Jesus, because then it also says we also approach Jesus, mediator of a new covenant. Uh, so we, it's not one or the other. I always, another thing too, I always tell people, is your wife's family still alive? Does she have relatives? Yes, yeah. my wife has her mother, who yeah. just actually came from her country, from Moldova, okay. to come to, and, to live with us. And so uh, you love your mother-in-law? I, I love, I, <laughs> she, no, no, I more than love. I say, she's our hero. I won't be here because if she was not here with us. And see, does that take away from your love of your wife? No, at all. No, exactly. Make it stronger. Exactly. Same with the love of the saints. They're like our in-laws. But our love of Jesus grows stronger because we love the saints. It's not competition. So, so, so the folks just understand. Um, also, I want to let people know that the, the relics of St. Pew are going to be in different parts of the United States, right? That's correct. Uh, especially from September 8th to November 9th, it's going to be in different uh, cities. If you want information about that, go to St. Pio Foundation, 
saintpiofoundation.org. That's saintpiofoundation.org. There are a lot of cities that need the saints' intercession. As a matter of fact, you could probably go back to Chicago. There has so much violence, so many killings, and these are the result of terrible sin. You know, the sins of violence and, and drugs and all sorts of things. We need St. Pio's, and there might be some places around the church that need his intercession too because of the problems that we've got with the priests at these points. So look that up at the stpiofoundation.org, and that way you can find out uh, where, if, if the relatives are going to be close to you, and go and pray. Pray for an end of sin in the areas where you live and, uh, and, and move. It's uh, much, much need for that. And how long has this St. Pio Foundation been uh, going? Four years and six months. Four years and six months. So it's just uh, a year and a half older than your son. Yes, exactly. Right. But that's why all the process started. When I start to intensify the prayer for, for Padre Pio, I start to really to work for him, to let his legacy be more known in this country. Well, keep this up and you'll have, your son will have some brothers and sisters? We hope for a sister or brother, whatever God's will. Yes, we really hope for it. We really hope for it. Also, there's a phone number. I'm going to give them the phone number. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can call 203-416-1400. One four seven one. Get more information about the relics and other things that uh, the the good works that St. Pio Foundation is doing. We have to take a break. We're going to come back in just a couple of minutes. So please stay with us because we have questions and such that we want to address as well. Uh, would you like to take a couple questions before we get back to some of the... Well, wait, before we go to questions, let me just ask you to tell us what these different relics are. For instance, over to your shoulder there, sure, what, what is that? We have a set of six relics. They are all first-class relics, exclusive for this one, which is a second-class relic. This is a... Uh, and so the people mantle. understand what yes. second-class relic means? A first-class relic means that is a, uh, is a, is a part of the saint's body or a blood stain or uh, a fragment of his bone, for instance, yeah. or a lock of hair like we have in this case. Right. A second class is some things that is, uh, the saint has used. It can be a Bible, it can be a gospel, it can be the mantle. Yeah, so, something that, he, that was yes, his. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And during the veneration, we do allow the faithful actually to touch the relics so that according to canon law, any things or religious object a religious object that touches a first or second class relic becomes a third class relic. Right. So the faithful that comes in veneration touching the relics, they will have their own spiritual sign with Padre Pio because the object will be a third class relic. Yep. Now this is a mantle, as a one uh, of, of Padre Pio's mantle, which is a second class relic, perfectly uh, in perfect conditions. Good. Then we have here, um, this is probably the most important piece of the collection because this is a handkerchief with Padre Pio's wet just hours when he passed away. Okay. So this is probably one of the la uh, last uh, um, relic we have of the saint mm -hmm. because um, there, are, there are not so many of these. Right. While, while Padre Pio was, for instance, uh, 
A glove is considered a second class relic, can be considered also a first class relic because of blood stain. Padre Pio was changing two pair of gloves each day. We don't have to forget that Padre Pio was losing half of a liter each day. So we have thousands of thousands of thousands of, thousand of Padre so, Pio gloves. So, and for those from the uh, United States, that's about a quart uh, of. Uh, is that right? Well, uh, I say a liter, half a liter, I don't know. Half a liter is two quarts. Two, two quarts, quarts, yes, yeah, two per quarts. day. So, indeed, he used to change two pair of gloves each day. So, while we have, you might have several gloves, you have just a few of the handkerchiefs. And on to the put moment. it further into the, sure. the English system of mm -hmm. measurement, um, you know, uh, two quarts, a half a liter, is the same as four pints of blood. Now, usually we give blood in pints. And this is four pints. Uh, you don't have too much more so, uh, in, in your system. So this is uh, a significant amount of blood lost. Uh, and I know that Mother Angelica had received one of his gloves I was told. some years ago. I was told. I remember when that, when that arrived. And what are the other relics? So we have here uh, some crushed, uh, crust of his wounds, because as you know, Padre Pio has the stigmata. So, of course, they were collecting carefully every time the crusts were falling from his hands. Mm -hmm. And as well, we have a cotton guards with blood stain and uh, uh, a lock of hair of Padre Pio. Okay. So we have all first class relics here. This is a first or second class. This is a second class relic. Okay. Yeah, because this has some of the blood stain. Yeah, because he has blood stain right. in Padre Pio's right. own DNA. Yeah, he would wear these uh, fingerless gloves. That's uh, correct. Because it Except was. Except during masses. Except during masses. Except during masses. Okay. All right, now, let's, uh, we've got that, so that I'm sure our audience was curious. Now, let's take a look at some questions. Let's start off with this lady. Ma'am, where are you from? My name is Jean Pitto, and I am from Beaumont, Texas, born in New Orleans, Louisiana. Why aren't you something? Yeah. <laughs> That's all sort of Cajun up in that area. Creole. Yeah, Creole. <laughs> you're Creole. And Creole folk got around that whole area That's too, along right. the coast, because there's so much good shrimp and crawfish. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and so your question, ma'am. I want to ask about Padre Pia's suffering. I have chronic pain and it's getting progressively worse. Sure. And I have difficulty, you know, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I, I lift it up for the situation we're in now. But it's, uh, sometimes it's just hard. I just don't wanna pray or anything. And I would be inspired to know, I, I read a book of his already, but it didn't just give me the understanding sure. of how it, you know, he overcame that. All right, Luciano. Uh, you remind me what uh, a story that I heard from Father John Daria, which is was one of Father Pio's secretary who lives in Bronx now. Right, right. And, he, uh, he's an American. Yeah, yeah, yes. Now it's a full, fully American, although mm -hmm. he's born in, was born in Italy, and he uh, served Padre Pio for the last ten years of, of right. Padre Pio's life. So the way we see things, he told me, you know, everybody was asking and was asking for Padre Pio's intercession how they can bear their own suffering, their own cross. We all are called to bear our own cross. And there was this specific friar that was waiting for the moment and was saying, when I can ask Padre Pio to help me to realize my miracle, this friar was blind. So he was waiting, was waiting, was waiting. One day he had the courage and he told Padre Pio, I'm asking, can you help me? I never was able to see, I would like to see. He bear this pain for all his life. It was more than 50 when he asked this to, to Padre Pio. Padre Pio told him, I will reply to your question tomorrow. The day after, Padre Pio went to the friar and says, I'm sorry to tell you that I was told that you will have different sight. From that moment on, that friar was the most happy, I was told from Father John, because he received the spiritual knowledge by Padre Pio that that was his suffering and he was suffering for a cause, but he had a different view. So based on, based on the question we received, I, of course I don't have the answer. I do know that each of us have their own pain. We have our own cross. And what we have to recognize in Padre Pio is that he went furthermore that actually wanted to bear the, the, the cross of the others. If he could, would have taken all the crosses, all the pain of the others on himself because of his love for Jesus. And I think, too, um, I was just in the Liturgy of the Hours in the Maronite Rite 
we just had this reading from Colossians chapter 1, where St. Paul said, I rejoice in my sufferings because I fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ by my sufferings for the sake of His body, the church. And I think it's very important for us to see that there is a type of union with Christ on the cross that goes on with our sufferings. That, you know, why is it lacking in Christ? I and mean, he's, he's infinite God, yes, but His body, the church, hasn't filled up all of its quota of sufferings. There's been lots of sufferings, over 70 million martyrs over the last 2,000 years, and many other sufferings still go on, uh, sometimes self-inflicted. And these are things where we then join that suffering to Christ and find that just as His suffering was for the salvation of the world, when we join, it's not by our power, but it's by union with Christ's sufferings that our sufferings take on a meaning and are directed to salvation of others. And it's especially through offering them at Mass. That's the primary place. That's why Mass was so absolutely central to Padre Pio that the Mass is where you present it through the priest. That's how it's set up. And it's joined with Christ, and your sufferings are a natural gift, like the bread and the wine. When the priest consecrates them into the body and blood of Christ, which is that the consecration is the moment of celebrating the death of Christ, then our sufferings are united with the cross at that moment by the consecration. And then Holy Communion is a sign of the resurrection, that God brought good out of the crucifixion of the Son of God, and sometimes what we don't see yet, He brings good out of the sufferings we let Him transform. That's part of what we have to do. We have another question from our studio. Sir, where are you from? I am from Silver Spring, Maryland. Good to have you here. Welcome. Yes, and your question or comment? Well, it's wonderful. You know, we can all relate to Padre Pio. He's a, 20, a 20th century saint. I was in my teens when he passed away. Of course, he was a great blessing in his time and in our day and time for the church. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the stigmata. And, you know, as we know, Padre Pio had such a deep, devotion and connection to Jesus that he shared in his suffering. So I'm wondering, when in his life did the stigmata begin, and have there been other saints who've experienced the stigmata? Great. So, thank you. Luciano, well, when did the stigmata begin in his life? Padre Pio's stigmata were received in 1918, 100, 100 years ago for the first time. And we don't have to forget that in, in Padre Pio's own way, he always asked Jesus not to make them visible he would rather bear the pain of the stigmata, but not to make them visible. And because we know, actually, because the, the stigmata were visible, they brought him all the suffering, or even being persecuted by some of the op officials from the Vatican. Uh, in other terms, he carried them those stigmata for 50 years, until a few weeks, actually, he already knew he was going to die. So for 50 years, Padre Pio bear the stigmata. There were actually five, visible five, although there was a sixth, sixth wound, the one where Jesus was carrying his cross. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned this to Pope John Paul II, where the Pope was a priest and visited Padre Pio, I believe, in 1947. Mm -hmm. Was the one that hurt me more is the one that nobody can see. And he showed that his shoulder is where actually Jesus brought his cross. There was in fact, and it's, it's interesting because there is a strong devotion in Europe more than in America to the wound of, on Christ's shoulder, you know, where he carried the cross. That's, that is a, a popular devotion that's known better in Europe than here. So it's interesting that he had that sixth wound. Indeed. And as other saints who received the stigmata, the first that I can think of is St. Francis, or what, you know, 
Padre Pio himself was called Francesco Forgione because he was a, uh, a devotee of, of, of uh, um, St. Francis and belonged to the same order. Sure, sure. Yeah, there have been a few other folks, um, but uh, I think Padre Pio is the only priest. He's the only priest, that's correct. The only uh, priest who was stigmatized. Right, right. Uh, that, that you have a number of others. St. Saint, uh, Saint Francis of Assisi was the deacon. Was a deacon. But not a, but not a not priest. A priest. Good, yeah, this is good to know. And um, th this is something else. I just want to make sure we don't have any other questions. Um, when um, we're dealing with this stigma, again, it's, it's something that became well known. It also became a source, as you say, of persecution. Why would the stigmata lead some people to harass him? and even try to silence him. Well, apparently it, it all belonged from the fact when uh, Father Gemelli, Agostino Gemelli, visited Padre Pio. Uh, Father Agostino Gemelli was working in the Vatican by then, and he was recognized as being uh, no, a very important figure, and he went to visit Padre Pio, and he asked to see his stigmata. Accordingly with the story that we know officially, mm -hmm. he went and he said that I am sent by Rome to see and to declare if your stigmata are, are true or not. And Padre Pio refused. Refused because he knew, of course, one of his many virtues of Padre Pio kno knew very well when a person was telling the truth or not. He says, when you are really sent by Rome, by the congregation, then I will show you my stigmata. So the first report Padre Gemelli sent back to Rome was not in favor of Padre Pio. He uh, says words that were not common to to describe in Italian language, but he did indeed disprove that Padre Pio was an honest man. And that's why everything started, because I believe in a certain way, Padre Pio, while he was alive, already was attracting hundreds of thousands of people from all over the globe. People were asking for intercession. We do have story of people, sure. I would like to call even the, 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 the Padre Pio Center here in Barto, uh, the Calandra family here I met for, for many years ago, where Vera left and went to meet Padre Pio a few months before Padre Pio passed away because Padre Pio told her, don't wait, come here. And then she came and then they received uh, the, the miracle she requested from Padre Pio. And then again, in the same way, in a small way I'm doing, we're trying to bring the legacy of this man because I believe that God sent his best son on the most important times. We don't have to forget that Padre Pio came during First and Second World War. Yeah. So that is very important. Yeah. I. Th I th I oftentimes remind our, our audiences that the 20th century was the most violent century in history. The only one that comes close to it is the 13th, when the Mongolian invasions led to 50 million people being killed. But in the 20th century, it was 305 million people were killed in wars of uh, nationalism. Uh, nationalism ravaged Italy under Mussolini, mm -hmm. Germany under Hitler, and Mus uh, World War I it was uh, based on nationalism. But the communists were even worse than the Nazis or the nationalists uh, in Spain and other countries. The communists you know, killed uh, far more people, about 200 million. Uh, and we see such large numbers, it's hard to believe, but that was the fruit of atheism, is this the biggest spread of death in human history. And this is where our Lord sent Padre Pio and gave him the stigmata a year after Fatima, which is another question. I don't know if you know this. We didn't get a chance to talk about this, but did he have much of a devotion to Our Lady of Fatima? Was Fatima important to him? Absolutely. Yeah, I thought Absolutely. so. Uh, do, you, can, do you have anything to add on that? Oh, well, I do, I do know that, yeah, that uh, I mean, first of all, the, La Madonna, the, the same way we call in Italian, it was his main core. He always asked everybody around, even when he found the Padre Pio Pier group, the Pegar La Madonna. It's mm. very important. I know he has a, a, a great spiritual connection, devotion for Fatima. I don't know uh, to go into detail right, right, things that happened, but, but I 
I'm well aware of that. And he, he would oftentimes say, go get my weapons, but he meant his rosary. His rosary. That was, he, that was his weapon. His rosary, because sometimes he said that he could not even count how many rosary he was saying during the day, because somebody was asking, how many rosary you say that I don't count? That's because right. he was constantly with his rosary in yes. his hands. Right, right, right. And that's, um, I, I think that's another component that is very needed. Uh, in the late 60s, not long, you know, right around the time he passed away, uh, you, you began to see uh, theologians and clergy and religious tell us not to pray the rosary. You have young people who are not even taught how. They, I, I know this, now he's a priest, um, but when he was in catechism class, he didn't even know that there were mysteries of the rosary. He, he had alone how many mysteries there are. Didn't know how to say the glory be. Didn't know how to say the creed. He only knew the Hail Mary and the Our Father. Mm -hmm. And it was only when he became a novice in the Jesuits that he found out how to say the glory be and to know the mysteries. Um, that neglect of devotion to the Blessed Mother, sometimes in the name of ecumenism, well, others, Christians don't have a devotion, so we'll sort of, you know, mm -hmm. be quiet about that. And removal of statues of Our Lady and devotions to Our Lady did not end up well. And you look at someone like Padre Pio, he needed that devotion to Our Lady for the sake of his own holiness, as well as interceding for others. As you say, he was his most powerful weapon. Yeah, yeah, very much so, very much so. And in fact, one of our, one of our uh, viewers sent me a rosary made out of bullets. Spent bullets, not live ones. Okay, <laughs> just in case. But it's, it's an example of how Isaiah said that you beat swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Uh, well, we got bullets beaten to rosary beads mm -hmm. uh, and make it uh, a weapon of mass oration. And by the way, I like it, I see there are many many, many movements now that, yes. that, that are starting for praying the roses across the country and they try to do it together, so to raise the voices to God. So exactly. I, th I think there is always, exactly. I'll come back and our struggle is always to um, show that the rose is still present. I remember the first time I was performing even, I was having, uh, at the end of the concert I was always showing the rosary that is always me. It's like the picture of your mother. My mother passed away in 2005 for cancer. Yeah. So I always keep it in my wallet as well right. as the rosary because there is always time to dedicate for prayer. And the rosary is indeed the most powerful session. That's why we put even on the t-shirt. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I noticed that and I, I think one of the other points I hope that happens as you make this mm -hmm. uh, tour with the relics is that people do pick up from Padre Pio the importance of praying the rosary and that priests return to praying the rosary more. We need that for our spirituality. What we experience is that every time we bring the relics around the country, first of all, we remember that it's a bishop has to agree or to make a special uh, request to obtain the relics right. in a certain diocese. Right. We see that people are called to confession. In certain, in, in certain parishes, even they have four or five priests, they were overwhelmed by the request of confession. In a certain way, almost like confessing with Padre Pio, not confessing with the Padre, but you are confessing in his presence. And they felt that. That was an important fact for me because I see people were coming to me, I didn't confess for 20 years, 30 as well, it's never too late. That's right. That's what I, I mean, I, I'm not a priest, but say it's never too late. We are always, we, we have the sins, we do carry our sins, but it's always time to repent for it and to start, start it's, again. I am a priest for 42 years and I know it's not too late ever. You know, I, I'll hear a confession on a deathbed or I'll, I'll hear it, you know, when they're in a line and they've got lots of time after 20 years, 60 years even, you know, uh, you know people stay away and you're welcome. You're welcome back, and that's that's my attitude. Not, why, why aren't you here? No, don't need. Mm. Welcome home, welcome home. And at the confessional, he knew that at the confessional, you meet Jesus Christ on the cross, saying to us, 
Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. This is what Christ does for us. You know, with the people, that was the people trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a important element. And uh, just one other question too about the foundation. You mentioned that this is a foundation. What is it that the foundation does besides share the relics? Well, we do several activities. Uh, we do, us, for instance, you mentioned before about priests. This year, particularly, we are sponsoring 50 priests to go to San Giovanni Rotondo in Petrolcina for any spiritual exercises with Monsignor Pirino Galeone, Padre Pius' friend I mentioned before. Nice. Despite the fact that he's 93 years old, he does spiritual exercises for priests around the world. So Fantastic. what we want to do is just, you know, finding a way for having priests, for instance, look at Padre Pio more deep in, into his life. So by sponsoring in October, we are going towards the end of October, visiting a journey with Padre Pio, where he was born in Petrocina, then going to San Giovanni Rotondo, and stay with those that actually live with Padre Pio to come up again with a new life, in a certain mm -hmm. way, to mm -hmm. find that, 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 that spirituality, to come back in this country and having a more powerful tool of converting people or to sharing with their, with their faithful in each parishes what they've done, mm -hmm. what they've learned or to bring the sign of Padre Pio to them. Then, of course, being an artist, still, we have concert, we have a concert in Carnegie Hall this year in December. Why Carnegie Hall? People ask me, well, because Carnegie Hall is top temple of opera or music, yeah, yeah. and I believe Padre Pio deserve it. Yeah. And then, so, next year we're going with, with the three different uh, sponsor conferences with the friends of Padre Pio, two of the friends of Padre Pio, which are friars, will be coming here to having a conversation with priests and tell us actually what to look as a sample in Padre Pio when you are actually go deep into his own life. I think that that's going to be an important thing. And I think also, I, I, it's just so that we, again, we didn't mm -hmm. talk about, but um, given the present crisis, this would be a great time for retreats for reparation and penitence to be done you know, with his sponsoring, his guidance, his inspiration, so that the priesthood itself can be more purified and come back to what he was. Uh, you know, great saints, this is a very important thing. We really hope to do that every year. We're starting this year, but our intention to do every year. So of course, then we, we give some grants to certain Catholic organization, organization that are locally, that wants to uh, spread the legacy of Padre Pio, for instance, uh, we received a few months ago a request to do a Padre Pio walkway or to having uh, um, a hall within a medical facility dedicated to Padre Pio. We're trying to bring the name and his legacy there where we can actually be more close to the community, mm -hmm. but always in the name of St. Pio. In a certain way, our motto is always, as you, as you read on our website, bringing relief from suffering to those in need in the name of Padre Pio. Yeah, and you know, so that was part of his life too, so folks don't even know. He helped start a hospital over in San Giovanni Rotondo for the poor. And how he started the hospital, which yeah. is even more imaginable. This is another big miracle. If you consider that the, the, the Padre Pio hospital was created thanks to an intervention from General Jackson, which is, was a director of the United Nations uh, relief uh, agency, former UN agency, which request for a, a grant of 250 millions of lire in 1948 to be into the Martian plan. And it was a US Congress act that sent this money back for Padre Pio to build the hospital. Now there's a kind of influence on Congress I want to see more of. Uh -huh. <laughs> there okay. you go. All right. Well, Luciano, I'm so sorry. We've run out of time. I just want to be able to let people know it's the St. Pio Foundation.org, or you can call 203 416 1471 for the American tour of the Padre Pio relics from September 8th to November 9th. I want to thank you very much for taking time to be with us and use this relic of his glove with his uh, bl uh, blood in it. May Almighty God bless you by the intercession of St. Pio, guide you to his peace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.
And not only do we thank Luciano and his foundation, but we also want to thank you because your support of EWTN makes it possible for us to share these things. We ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay all of our bills too and keep bringing you more such programs. God bless you and thank you.